Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're now looking at uh, also Chapter 6 here in uh, Michigan's Money and Banking. And now we're going to turn, turn to the term structure of interest rates. And here, the question is it a little bit different than when we were talking about the risk structure of interest rates. The idea is we want to take what we did with the, term, the risk structure and turn it on its head. Now what we want to do is fix liquidity. We want to fix default risk, and we want to fix tax considerations. So we want to make those things identical across a whole bunch of different bonds. And now we want to vary the maturity of the bonds. So we want to see why is it that bonds with different maturities, but all other factors equal, have different interest rates. And so what we have, we'll see, we have what's called the yield curve. The yield curve is a picture of securities that all have the same general considerations except for the, the, uh, the uh, maturity. And so on the left, we have what we call a normal yield curve, and we'll see that's going to be in, important for us here, is that ordinarily, other things equal, as the maturity of a security rises, its interest rate tends to rise. But every once in a while, we have the reverse situation called an inverted yield curve, where short-term interest rates are relatively higher than long-term interest rates. There are also, by the way, a number of other different shapes, and these are only two of the more common ones. The most common, of course, it turns out, is a uh, upward sloping yield curve. Now, here's what we want to do. We want to develop theories in terms of being able to explain commonly observed facts of the yield curve. So it turns out we have three commonly observed facts that we need to be able to try to explain. So our first fact is that yield curves usually slope upward. In other words, short-term interest rates usually are lower than long-term interest rates. So we need to be able to explain that. Also, another interesting empirical feature is this. Interest rates along the yield curve tend to move together. Not perfectly, and not 100% of the time, but enough of the time so that on average, for example, when short-term interest rates tend to rise, long-term interest rates tend to rise, and vice versa. So yield curves, more or less on average, shift up and down together in parallel. Not all the time, but at least enough of the time so it's a generally accepted empirical observation. And then finally, and this is a, a slightly more uh, nuanced thing to explain. So let me take a shot at it like this. Suppose that you know that historically, or by historical standards, short-term interest rates are abnormally low. Suppose that's the only piece of information you have. So you don't know what's going on with the whole rest of the yield curve. You just know short-term interest rates are historically low. You have a good shot at being able to predict accurately that the yield curve slopes upward. The reverse is also true. On average, if short-term interest rates are higher than normal, there's a better-than-average chance the yield curve is going to slope downward. So the idea is this. If you know only the short end of the yield curve, you have a good idea or good ability to predict what the overall curve will look like. So what we want to do here is try to explain these three general observed facts. So it turns out, coincidentally, there are three theories. There's the expectations hypothesis, the segmented markets hypothesis, and the liquidity premium theory. Now, it turns out that all three of these are actually also, it's also called the preferred habitat theory. It turns out that the first two really are special cases of the third one. And so let's take a look at the third one, the preferred habitat theory, to see how that works. The preferred habitat theory assumes that both buyers and sellers of bonds have preferences. Buyers, other things equal, tend to prefer to buy short-term securities. Short-term securities might have lower default risk, they might have lower inflation risk, they might have lower uh, interest rate risk, and all whole variety of other factors that might make it so that buyers prefer other things equal short-term securities. Sellers, on the other hand, have precisely the opposite preference. Other things equal, they tend to prefer hold longer-term securities because that might, for example, give them more certainty in terms of their interest payments. And so you see a problem right away. Bond buyers want to buy short-term, bond sellers want to sell long-term. So somehow the market has to reconcile those two things. And the way they reconcile them is this. If you can offer bond buyers a good enough yield, a high enough yield, that will entice them out of their preferred 
uh, their preferred short-term security holdings, and they'll buy long-term securities. Likewise, if you offer bond sellers a low enough interest rate, you can convince them to sell some short-term securities. Now, not you can't convince everybody all the time, but if you can convince enough, then you can get markets to work. So we have a simple formula here. Oh, the sound effects even work. Now, this looks pretty complicated and terrible, but it's really not. What we've got on the left side is really just the long-term interest rate. So the example we're going to use here in just a minute is a one-year interest rate and a two-year interest rate. So on the left side, we'd have just a two-year interest rate. And what we'll discover is this, that a two-year interest rate is just nothing more than a geometric average of a bunch of short-term interest rates. In our simple example that we use, it's going to be a, a, um, an, uh, an average of two one-year interest rates. Plus, that little L term on the end is a term premium. That's the extra little yield you have to offer bond buyers to hold a longer-term bond. So the best way to see this in action is to do an example. So suppose we have a two-year bond. So we have a two-year time period. Oh, there we go. We have cars coming in and everything. So on the left side there, we have a compounded two-year return on a two-year security. Over on the right, we have two consecutive one-year bonds. We have the first one-year bond here, and we have the second one-year bond right here. Now, here's the problem is that we know the interest rate on the two-year bond today. We know the interest rate on the one-year bond today, but we don't know the interest rate on the bond that we would buy in one year, because here's what we're trying to do. We have a two-year time horizon, like so. So here we are right now. Here we are a year from now. Here we are two years from now. So we have a choice. We can buy one two-year bond that spans that entire period. We can buy two one-year bonds, a one-year bond for right now, and then another one-year bond in a year. We could buy four six-month bonds that run consecutively. We could buy even 24 one-month bonds that would run consecutively. And the idea is that what we'll see here is that the long-term interest rate, in our case, it's two years, so it's really not that long, the two-year interest rate is nothing more than the average, the geometric average, of shorter-term interest rates. Now, again, again crucial thing here, long-term interest rates are just an average of shorter-term interest rates. So now, with our numbers, what we can do is this. We have uh, two years, and let's just make the yield on a two-year bond 10%, the yield on a one-year bond 8%, and let's imagine the term premium is 0.01. In other words, you have to add a little bit extra to convince people, bond buyers in this case, to hold a two-year bond versus a one-year bond. So the only thing we don't know is the yield on the second one-year bond. In other words, a one-year bond a year from now. So we can do some basic math, and there we go. So on the left side, we have the compound return, and this turns out to be 1.21. So over two years, we get a 21% return. And that 21% return has to equal the 8% return we get in the first year plus the return we get in the second year. And remember the crucial thing here is we don't know what that second year return is going to be, but we have an expectation of what it's going to be. And then plus our, our 0.01 term premium. And what this turns out to be is 11, just a little bit over 11%. And so notice what we have here is we have a positively sloped yield curve. We have our maturity here. So here's my bad handwriting in action. You have the interest rate. You have a one-year security at 8% and a two-year security at 12%. So using my very simple and small yield curve, I have an upward sloping yield curve. So I have the standard looking yield curve. Again, remember, this is very simple here for our, for our example. So what this is telling us is that a year from now, financial markets expect interest rates on one-year securities to be just a little bit over 11%. So they're expecting them to go up by a little over three percentage points compared to the current 
on the one-year bond that exists right now. Now, this term premium, in other words, the extra little oomph that you've got to give bond buyers to hold longer-term securities, is positive and increasing in N. Now, what that means is that the longer you go out in terms of maturity, the more extra return you have to give bond holders to convince them to hold a five-year bond versus a 10-year bond versus, for example, a 30-year bond. And so what happens is the fact that that term premium gets bigger and bigger and bigger the longer the maturity is, that, it turns out, can help explain fact one. Why is it that yield curves slow upward? Now, in addition, remember, the liquidity premium um, hypothesis here says that uh, bond buyers and bond sellers can be uh, enticed out of their preferences. And so let's suppose that long-term interest rates go up. Well, if long-term interest rates rise relative to the short-term interest rates, some bond buyers are going to look and say, gosh, that's an attractive deal. So they'll sell their short-term securities and they'll buy their long-term securities. And what happens in that sense is that you will see that the yields tend to move together. So short-term interest rates tend to move along with long-term interest rates. Not perfectly, but enough so that's a general empirical observation. And so then this then helps explain fact two. And then finally, there we go. If short-term rates are relatively low, as we just saw in our example, what people will tend to think, like we just saw in our example, is that short-term rates are expected to go up. So longer-term rates, therefore, will be higher than, on average, short-term rates. Again, crucial thing here for fact three is if we have low short-term rates, we expect, the, we expect them to rise in the future. And so this helps us explain fact three. Now, suppose that our term premium, this is, this is an L, not a one. Suppose that our term premium is zero. Here's what this implies. Bond buyers don't require any extra uh, interest return in order to hold long-term securities versus short-term securities. In other words, they don't care. And so what this means is that short and long-term bonds become perfect substitutes for each other. And what happens is that in our equation that describe the link between long-term rates and short-term rates is that now the long-term rate really is just an average of the shorter-term rates. And this is what's called the expectations hypothesis. So here we have an example. So notice that there is no extra premium out here in order to get bond buyers to hold the two-year bond. So when you run the math through, it turns out that the one-year rate a year from now is expected to be 12%, not the little over 11% in the previous example. So notice that once you allow for compounding, 8% and 12% really do average to be average out to be 10%. Now, one interesting thing here is this. In my example, I've got lower short rates and higher long rates. If these one-year and two-year bonds are perfect substitutes from each other, we shouldn't see that interest rate differential, should we? We should see it so that bond buyers would buy the longer-term bond and they would sell the shorter-term bond so that those two interest rates would meet somewhere in the middle and we'd end up with a really, really interesting looking yield curve. It would look just like, just like that. It would be a flat yield curve because nobody would care about the maturity. People would only be trying to go after the best interest rate. And if they go after the best interest rate, that will, over time, make sure that all interest rates along the yield curve will tend to be the same. Well, now let's reverse the situation. Suppose that, like before, bond buyers and bond sellers both have preferences. But let's suppose these preferences are so strong that they simply cannot be enticed out of the maturity that they tend to prefer. What happens here now is this, is that because those markets become segmented, and that's the name of the hypothesis here, the segmented market hypothesis, they become segmented is that the interest rates on those different uh, securities with varying maturities will tend not to change, or will tend not, I'm sorry, tend not to be correlated. And if they're not correlated, that makes it difficult to explain fact two of the yield curve. 
because in effect what you have is something like this. You have two separate markets for bonds and there's effectively a wall between them. And so what happens in one market does not affect the other market and vice versa. Whereas in the preferred habitat model and the expectations model, there is movement back and forth between those two markets. Here, with the segmented mark hypothesis, there is no movement. The only way you get that is if you have some sort of common shock. And so again, this is the segmented mark hypothesis. So here's what we tried to do here. In this short video segment, we tried to look at why is it the case if you hold all other factors constant except maturity, why bonds with different maturities or varying maturities have varying interest rates. So we tried to come up with a simple theory to try to explain this and explain three observed facts. And then we also looked at the two extreme cases, the segmented mark hypothesis and the expectations hypothesis. And there we are.